But let's start at the first point, and that is uh, apologetics are important for the body of Christ. And I mean local churches here, uh, because it's commanded. And the obvious example of that, many of you are familiar with, it's in First Peter chapter 3 and verse 16. So there's another 316 for you, easy to keep in mind. Actually, it's 315 and 16. So um, in this particular passage, Peter is talking about godly living and having a godly impact on people around you. He starts with relationships, particularly marriage relationship in chapter 3. And then he generalizes and says, you know, don't fight with your spouse but um, or with other people in general to sum up. And he's given a lot of things here. He says, let, let all be harmonious and sympathetic and brotherly and kind-hearted and humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, insult but giving a blessing instead. And then he goes on, by the way, and that's by the, you're, the way you're supposed to live because you were, you were called— for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing, and the way to inherit the blessing is to be a blessing to others. This kind of his line of thinking. Now, who do we bless? Well, one of the kinds of people we bless are people who are hostile to us. And if you are blessing and being good and whatever to people, that's going to take a lot of the hostility out of the equation. In fact, he says in verse 13, who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? So if you're doing what's right, who's going to harm you? And then it's almost like he gives it a second thought. He said, hmm, uh, actually, there are some people who are going to harm you for doing what's good. And even if that is so, and you suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed, and do not fear them. That is their intimidation, and don't be troubled. But, and so in other words, he's offering an antidote now, an antidote to the hardship that you encounter because you are living a faithful life as a Christian, which includes being a blessing to others, not being nasty to others, not being mean to others, but being a blessing to them. And he says, uh, and this is where our verse comes in, but sanctify, that means to set apart, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. Okay, that's the foundation. We're, an ambas we're ambassadors. We represent the Lord, Jesus Christ. He is central to this enterprise. So we remind ourselves, okay, there it is, foundation, Jesus. And then he says, always being ready to make a defense. There's your apologia in Greek. To everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that's in you. Okay, so there's our commandment after a fashion, but it's embedded in this whole thing about engagement with the world. And he adds then, and keep a good conscience, so that in the thing in which you are slandered, in other words, people saying bad things about you, those who revile your, what turns out to actually be good behavior in Christ, will be put to shame. For it's better if God should will it so that you suffer for doing what is right than for doing what is wrong. Okay, so notice the whole thing here. We are to make a defense, but that isn't in isolation, like go out there, defend the faith, knock them down, win the argument. Show them what idiots they are. That's not Peter's project. It shouldn't be ours. We're ambassadors. Knowledge, wisdom, character, character in an attractive manner. And so we are trying to um, be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, humble in spirit, not return it evil for evil, insult for insult, blessing instead. And when we bless, good things happen. Generally, but not always. And sometimes we get pushback. And so how do we respond? Well, we make a defense and give an answer while still trying to be a blessing and keep a good conscience so that in the thing which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior may be put to shame. So we show them that we are not going to answer in kind. We are going to do things differently than they're doing. And by doing it differently, it shames them. 
So we are making a defense, but we are making a defense in a way that continues to be a blessing and shames the opponent. Given their accusations against us, when actually it turns out we're doing well, we're acting properly, we are being gracious in the process. We are keeping a good conscience, and we are willing to suffer if that be what God intends, and First Peter is all about that, by doing what is right rather than the opposite, doing what's wrong. Defending the faith in a jerky fashion. We're not going to do that. That brings a different kind of contempt from those we speak to, one that we have caused, not one that the message itself has caused. And by the way, this idea of suffering according to the will of God by doing what's right is reflected in chapter 4 at the end. Therefore, those who suffer according to the will of God, which is the will of God, and it's part of what he's saying here in First Peter, shall entrust their souls to, faith, to a faithful creator in doing what is right. So we're right back to that same theme again. So there's our command. <clears throat> but there's also, that's an explicit command, but there's also a kind of an implicit command as well. And um, <clears throat> I want you to Pardon me. I want you to think of uh, of Philippians right now, and this is—I know you've had this experience where you've been reading the Bible for years and years, and then you see something that you never saw. saw, Where'd that come from? Never saw it before. How did I miss that? Well, that happened to me a couple of months ago, uh, going through the letter of Paul to the Philippians in chapter 1. And what uh, Paul does when he starts out is he's saying, hey, I'm glad for you guys. I'm thankful. And I know uh, that since uh, if, since your participation in the gospel from the first day until now, I am confident that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. In fact, uh, that, was, that was the verse I pre- preached my first sermon on as a Christian. I was probably three years old, two years old or so two and a half years as a Christian. I had a Bible study in Westwood Village. A group of people came. In any event, uh, I digress. He continues, For it's only right for me to feel this way, confidence, about you, because I have you in my heart, since both in my imprisonment, so he is writing this from prison, and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers of grace with me. Well, this is interesting. Paul says that what he is doing, um, and and actually intimates later why he's in prison, is because he is defending the gospel and confirming it. Now, how do you confirm what you're defending? By giving good reasons. And I suspect some of those reasons were miracles, we know that from the book of Acts. But that wasn't the only thing he appealed to, okay? Uh, the, the gospel which he was defending was confirmed. And then he goes on uh, uh, talking about how there is some strife in light of his imprisonment. And that those circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel, verse 12, and that the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard, verse 13. And most of the brethren trusting in the Lord because of his imprisonment are now moving about and speaking more courageously, which surprises me a little bit. Because Paul's in prison, now they're more courageous. Interesting. But then he says that the group is actually divided because some are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, but some also from goodwill. And so some are trying to cause him trouble, and so they're competing with Paul, Paul, and Paul can't, in a sense, defend himself much because he's in prison, so there's competition out there. But he says there's others that have a good attitude. They're doing it for right reasons. And by the way, it doesn't matter what the reasons are as long as the gospel's preached, he says, whether in pretense or in truth, the gospel, truth, the gospel's preached. But he does say this about the latter, those who do with the right attitude. They do it out of love, knowing, here you go, that I am appointed 
for the defense of the gospel. Did you ever see that before? Paul says earlier, he, he in his, his imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, so this there's apologetics that is being referred to there, defending the faith. Verse 16, he says, I have actually been called to do that. Actually, he doesn't use the word called. He says appointed for the defense of the gospel. I've been appointed for the defense of the gospel. So there you have kind of a, an implicit reference to the obligation of defending the gospel. In Paul's case, he had a, apparently a specific charge that this was a big part of what he does. But um, Peter is saying this is, should be part of the repertoire to some degree of all Christians to silence the critics and to shame them with our good arguments and our good behavior. 